and watch any replays that you haven't already watched. Um, they're all free and open to the public on Crowdcast. Uh, this event will be recorded as well, and a replay will be available after it ends at the same link that you signed up for this event. Uh, so we hope you enjoy the event and share the link with your friends so that they can watch later. Um, before I go into a little bit more detail, I would love to quickly introduce our amazing authors that we have here today. Um, and maybe you guys can just like do a little wave as I introduce you so we all know who we're talking about. Um, so first is Tasha Suri. Tasha Suri is the World Fantasy Award winning author of several novels, including The Jasmine Throne and its sequel, The Oleander Sword. Next, Django Wetzler is the author of a number of fantasy novels, including the Burning Blade and Silver Eyes series, which began with Ashes of the Sun and the upcoming How to Become the Dark Lord and Die Trying, which releases in May of 2024. Thomas D. Lee is the author of Sunday Times bestselling novel, Perilous Times. And last but not least, Bethany Jacobs is the debut author of the science fiction novel, These Burning Stars, which has just came out, so you can go get it now. Um, so here's how this is gonna work. For the first 40 minutes, I'm gonna be asking the authors questions for them to discuss. And after that, we are going to be answering your questions. So you can click on the button on your right of your screen um, to access the Q&A session and submit your questions um, at any time during the whole event. Um, you can vote on other people's questions that you find interesting and we are going to stop, we're going to start with the top rated questions and kind of go down the list. Um, so let's jump in. Um, what makes a hero compelling? What about a villain? Is it their her heroic or villainous accomplishments, the motivation behind what they do, the way they overcome their flaws and imperfections? What do you guys think? Do we start with Tasha? I, I, I almost wish you hadn't started with me because like my instinctual answer is if you make a villain hot, people will find them interesting, um, <laughs> which isn't advice I live by. Often my villains are <laughs> villains are deeply unattractive people, but I do think that there is a lesson in there around um, the fact that if you make a villain compelling in some way, almost aspirational, feel free to disagree with me, everyone else, um, <laughs> it, it draws readers in because they both love and hate to love really compelling villains. Yeah, no, I, I think, think you're Tasha absolutely kind of right. Yeah, go, go ahead, Thomas. No, no, after you. I was just going to say, uh, to kind of echo what you're saying, Tasha, is I think that uh, a really good villain makes you look into yourself and see something familiar, right? Oh, and like yeah. that's part of the pleasure and the like um, uh, almost repulsion of the villain is if you can look into them and say like, ooh, that dark thing that they're doing is inside me somewhere. And like, I could never do that but there's a kind of catharsis in seeing them do that repulsive thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I de that's, that's a really good way of putting it. It's that, that sympathy that comes from kind of understanding someone's point of view, even if mm -hmm. you're not kind of on board with their point of view. Um, yeah. I like that. Yeah, there's something funny about it, isn't there? If you create a villain who is obviously in some way cartoonishly evil, but then in, an, in another way has a sort of compelling or, or understandable goal that they're trying to achieve. I think that I think then the, the, the reader is sort of nodding along and, and thinking, yeah, OK, I can root for this this person, even if they are kind of in some ways a cartoon villain. I think if if you introduce an element that, that people can connect with, then you've created a compelling villain, I think. It's it's a difficult balance, though. It's really easy to go too far, I guess, um, and either generate too much sympathy for the villain or then have to rapidly backtrack and make them do terrible things. Um, so it's villains in particular are sort of walking that line. I think that's yeah. Really I feel. I, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tasha. No, should we do rock paper scissors? Or <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear what you have to say. So you go. I I think my point might be a little bit controversial, but I've always thought of Lestat in interview with the vampire as the villain of that book. I know some people would disagree with me, but I I think he's a very good example of a character who is so clearly villainous and hot, 
um, mm -hmm. who ends up becoming, at least to many readers and to the author, the protagonist of, mm -hmm. of the series. Um, and, and it went too much in one direction rather than balancing the kind of villainy with mm. the, the kind of the, the traits he had that made us care about him. Yeah. I think that's that's clearly the author too. That you know mm, you read yeah. that book and she loves this character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think, think the villain can absolutely be the main character, mm -hmm. um, and often the the most interesting books have the villain as the main character, and they're trying to convince you that they're not the villain. But as the reader, you sort of increasingly believe that they are. That's a yeah, hard I think trick. Sort of speaking to what to what you said, Django, a minute ago about. Um, like having to walk your villain back. I think that's where like the writer has to develop their confidence that you don't want to walk your villain back. Like you, you want to, to have a clear enough sense of where the villain is going that you don't then in the final hour, like pull those punches and say, Oh, and now they're just a hundred percent redeemed because they, well, I actually good. kind of meant it in the opposite way where, mm -hmm. This this happens a lot in like TV shows. I think I feel like Marvel has been doing this lately in their stuff, where you have a villain and they they clearly like the villain and they're working really hard to make the villain sympathetic and and reasonable. But then they they sort of remember at the last minute that it's supposed to be a villain and yeah. that the hero needs some reason to beat them. And so then so you have someone who makes like totally reasonable arguments and you get their point of view, but then they're like, oh, and I'm also going to blow up this bus full of nuns just to, sh to make sure everyone remembers how bad I am. Right. It's the Killmonger effect of Black right. Panther, right? Where it's like, you know, K Killmonger was right. <laughs> no, like I was thinking of, I forget her name, but the, the villain of the uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier show who's like sort of refugee rights and you know she uh -huh. has a lot of important points but then for no reason she's like i'm just gonna kill everyone because that's that's what uh villains Apparently do I'm i guess guy. yeah uh-huh but then you compare that against like yes carly morgenthau I, from the chat is okay then you compare that against like a character like the joker mm -hmm. right who's so exciting and so compelling and but there is no like Oh, I see his point. Like you might see his, right. like you might understand some of the like the 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 social origins of what he's saying, but it's like a very different take on a villain where you're not supposed to um, agree with him at any point in the story, but you might still delight in what he's doing. Well, I think that gets to an important point, which is that there are many kinds of villain. Not every yeah. villain needs to be like the the mirror of the protagonist the sort of road not taken for the protagonist there are many kinds mm -hmm. there's yeah. the crazy one there's the reasonable one there's you know all these different roles that they can fill in the story yeah so do you guys prefer to write stories where there is a clear cut villain and a clear cut hero or do you guys tend to like to write stories where everyone is a little bit more complex and everyone has you know their valid viewpoints that might not be understood by every reader. What do you guys think? Or do you do, I am, I'm also interested, do you guys find it's easier to write like one over the other? Or do you think it's more difficult? I'm very curious to hear you guys' thoughts about that. I think complexity is fun. I, I enjoy introducing complications to books. Um, and sometimes I then regret it later and think, why did I make this so difficult for myself? But I think complexity is, interesting and it's fun for the reader and it's fun for me as the writer and the more kind of complexities i can introduce the better and that includes character motivations and it includes heroes who don't always do the right thing and it includes villains who sometimes have a good point or at least they're coming from a place that you understand um and i think that's much more interesting than the kind of binary divide between good and evil because I don't think that exists in the real world. I think good people do bad things and bad people sometimes mysteriously do good things. And it's interesting to explore that in fiction as well. At one point, I would have fully agreed with you on that. Um, but I think the last, let's say five years for argument's sake, um, have made me feel that there are, that good people can definitely do bad things. And I think morally ambiguous characters are really interesting to me. 
but there are also people who are just garbage like that have no decent motivations and if you wrote them into a book people would tell you that they were unrealistic and 2d um so i i often find that although i love writing morally ambiguous characters um where you could go oh, they've done something really awful or you know do i believe in them or trust them i also quite um stubbornly like to write villains who are villains who are just bad horrible people because i think that there are definitely people in the world who revel in causing pain and suffering and in um really using every tool in their sort of hegemonic arsenal to um establish their own power I'm not naming any names you can all come up with your own <laughs> guesses on who that might be um and i think that part of what we do in writing is is explore what exists in the world and what we hope exists in the world and what we don't want to look at right so I, I kind of like to have those on the page because they're unrealistically awful, but they're also completely realistic. Sasha, I completely agree with that. I find that I, for my protagonist, for my heroes, I want them to be morally gray. Like I don't, I'm not drawn to a hero who's just straight up paladin. Um, no, no pun intended, Thomas. Um, <laughs> that you know that they're they're just purely good. I, I find that a little bit dull. Um, but when I think about the people in our real world who I think of as villains, um, they might have motivations, uh, but I find so many of them just purely repugnant. Um, and so there is something to be said for you can write a villain who's just bad, you know, and and that can, I think, be familiar and cathartic for readers. For for me, it's it depends a lot on story structure. You know, I've done both. Um, and if your story is about the relationship between the hero and the villain, then it makes much more sense for the villain to be a sort of complicated, interesting type. Um, if if them going back and forth is going to be kind of the core of the story. Uh, then there's a lot more sort of room there than if they're just, you know, Dr. Evil. Um, but if your if your story is more about the relationship between, for example, a group of protagonists or heroes, then the villain may need to step back a little and actually sort of in, intentionally be less interesting because, you know, if if the story is about the band of people who need to like, you know, get over their personal differences to defeat the evil emperor or whatever, then the evil emperor can just be evil because they're more of the motivation for the story to happen than a character in the story. So you can sort of do it either way, right? Um, depending on where the sort of complexity of your story is, sometimes you can go too far. Django, what do you, what do you think though the the implications of that are for the idea of the hero the the villain as the um, foil for the hero, right? Where they so like for example in 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 my recent book there it's very much the the good guy and the bad guy have very much an intersection of in mm -hmm. their relationship and are going back and forth, but the bad guy is just purely bad. Um, yeah. And can the foil thing sort of explain that? Yes. I mean, it's not that the villain can't be purely bad, I feel like. I think they just need to be a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can, as as Tasha was saying, you can be a purely bad person, but still have some sort of depth. Um, just because someone has motivations doesn't mean that they're not bad. They can be bad motivations. Um, you know, it's it's in the, an example I've used before. It's the difference between in Star Wars between the Emperor and Darth Vader, right? In the original Star Wars, that that yeah. Darth Vader is a more complex character, at least by the end of the trilogy, because he's got this relationship with Luke and you know this this stuff going on. Then the Emperor, we never get any explanation. He's just yeah. bad. Mm -hmm. I actually think um, I keep thinking of Avatar: The Last Airbender. I'm afraid to bring that in um, because I think you can see that you know the the Fire Lord is it's a functional villain, I'd say. Like he's he's evil because he's evil. Um, but his function is he's also a father 
to to characters in the story and that makes him not necessarily relatable but have sort of a depth um a kind of a, a meaty level of interaction with the characters and, and a, an importance to the emotional arc of the story that he doesn't have by merit of personality um mm. but then you also have the layers of he's the big bad he's the you know here's the evil thing that everybody else has to deal with but then you have other villains at play who are more nuanced and complex like um Sorry to anybody who doesn't know about Avatar The Last Airbender, Azula. So she's a much more compelling and interesting villain, but you also need that other level of villainy to support her. So similar to Star Wars, I think. Yeah, that's a really good that. example. That's sort of exactly what I was was trying to get at. Is like the Fire Lord is the villain who doesn't need that complexity. He's the motivation for the plot rather than like much of a character. And Azula is very different. Somebody was saying that in the chat that it, having multiple villains is a kind of I don't want to say easy workaround or, or easy solution, but it's one it's one way of having both kind of degrees of evil in there. That if you have the the prime mover and shaker, the kind of dark lord of whatever, and then one of his lieutenants being a more interesting, complex character, then I think that's that's a sort of pattern people are familiar with, and they're more willing to accept the idea of the complex secondary character having a redemption arc or having a kind of complicated series of motivations um, because they're just sort of doing what they're told and then maybe they start to question their orders and that kind of thing. Um, so that's that's certainly one way of creating a compelling villain, I think, one who sort of starts to doubt whether he's doing the right thing. So how do you guys go about plotting a heroic or a villainous arc? Is it something that you're thinking about separate from plotting the overall story, or is it always tied to the plot for you? It's always tied to the plot for me, um, just because I am sort of of the school of thought that the character relationships and the character actions should be moving the plot forward in some way. And so when I think about, you know, if the villain is going to do this horrible thing, um, what are the impacts of that horrible thing on the protagonist or on the hero? And how does it drive what the protagonist and the hero is going to do next? So it doesn't always necessarily mean that the, that the villain themselves drives the plot, but the effects of their villainy is driving the plot, um, whatever that might look like. Yeah, I feel like I try to get the arcs and the plot as tied together as I can. Um, I think if they're too separate, it can feel a little disconnected. Um, which one comes first sort of depends on how the story occurs to me. Um, I mean, you try to get them to synergize, but you know, sometimes you come up with one first and then the other. Um, I don't know. I'm curious what other people think. I think it depends how central a protagonist the villain is. Um, so in most of my, perhaps every single one of my books, actually, um, the villain is not a central protagonist. The villain is an external character who the protagonists have to engage and tussle with in some way. Um, sorry if you heard that noise. There's loads of fireworks going on outside because it's the Bali, so almost. Um, so in those cases the villain's arc for me is always very driven by the plot and by the, the arc of the protagonists and what they need in order for their plot to move forward. Um, but I feel like if the villain was a more central character, um, somebody very close to the protagonist maybe, or even a protagonist, then I would be much more driven by the character arc in a more organic way, I think. Yeah, a, a distinction that we haven't talked about much, but that's really important, is whether the villain has a point of view in the story. Um, whether we're we're seeing from their point of view, either from a first person or a third person or whatever you're doing, uh, makes a huge difference as to kind of how much detail and character arc they have and need. Yeah, because I don't think... Um, correct me if I'm wrong, because there's probably some more um you know some lord of the rings nerds who know more about this than i do but i don't think sauron has a point of view at any point in no. any of the rings books um 
but Sauron is still one of the most sort of memorable villains in fantasy history. And we're kind of convinced that his motives are just pure evil and he wants to destroy the world um, out of spite, evidently. And we learn more about him in, in some, you know, the later stories that Tolkien wrote. But I think you can absolutely build a villain without ever having anything written from their point of view. Um, but, you know, there are there are other stories I can think of where the villain is a central character, like you were saying, Tasha, who sort of is at first maybe a protagonist and maybe they, they go along with the heroes, but they have a journey that takes them towards being the ultimate villain of the series. And that's very interesting as well, I think. I think, sorry, go ahead. The, uh, sorry, the um, the Sauron thing is is a good example of how if the villain is not a point of view, you need sort of less detail. You know, the, the closer we are to their point of view, the more of that kind of sympathy and complexity we talk about. Because if we're, if we're in somebody's head, it is boring if they're just like evil, 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 I'm just evil all day long. Like they, they need to think about what they're doing and why. Mm -hmm. I think it can be really fun too when a villain, if you want to think about a villain's motivations, like when those motivations are driven by fear. Um, like I, I just recently read Nettle and Bone um, and, and in Nettle and Bone, the real villain is this like evil prince and he does horrific, abusive things. Um, but everything he does is because he's terrified that if uh, that, that his family will be cursed if the wrong kid ends up on the throne. Um, and so like everything that drives him to do these really horrific things is is terror. Um, and so I think that's really interesting. So often we think about villains as being these um, these incredibly powerful characters like Palpatine, like Voldemort, like, you know, um, but when we can actually show that uh, that they're driven by what we think of as a vulnerable emotion rather than a powerful emotion, that can add a lot of complexity to them. And it doesn't mean that we feel sympathy for them. Um, but again, that idea of like being able to see something in the villain that looks familiar um, can and lend that complexity while still leaving us with a horrible villain. Speaking of villains, what do you guys think of villain origin stories? Do you feel like they're necessary? Can you generally point to a specific moment in the backstory of your books that inspired your villainous characters to become what they are? What do you think? I'm dubious of them in general. Um, it... I'm especially dubious of them as separate stories. I think a villain origin story to me is just never that interesting because it sort of ends with, and now I'm going to go do evil things. Mm -hmm. um, it can work, you know, in as part of a larger story, it works better. Um, mm. You know, it it can work as part of a tragedy, for example, where you have, you know, the classic is you have two characters who are together and then one of them, you know, takes a different path and they ultimately have to confront one another. You know, they, there's some sort of origin story in there. Um, yeah. But as always, you know, you got to be careful not to boil your characters down to, to one thing. Um, you know, I, I keep doing movie references because they're more common, but in a, a movie I love, which is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, it nonetheless always bugged me that we see the origin of all his famous character traits and they all happened on one day. Yeah. You know, he, he was dumped in a pit of snakes and he got his hat and he learned to use a bullwhip all on the same day. Um, yeah. It's just, you know, it's yeah, and he was like 19 for me. and then for the rest of his life he was Indiana Jones. You know, he didn't yeah, have any so. growth after that at all. Just yeah. was Indiana Jones for 20 years. Um, yeah, it's it's better if there's an arc rather than a sort of, and now, you know, I'll be, you know, evil man. I think that lots of times the reason why we get villain origin stories, like their own thing, right? 
um, is because we have a villain who's interesting. And so then we think, oh, well, everybody found this villain really interesting. So I'll write a whole story about them and why they became villainous. Um, and sometimes that to me can feel like we don't necessarily need that. Um, they can just be the villain that they are. And so, you know, Django, what you were saying about how making more sense when it's folded in to the existing story rather than, and now I'm going to write this story about the villain. Um, you know, like in, 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 so Tiana had asked about like how we do this in our own books and, and in my own book, my, my villain doesn't have like a thing that happened to her that then turned her evil. I don't think that for most people, that's how it is. Like um, there's not usually, I mean, sometimes there will be a thing, but for the most part, it's a series of things. And, and in the case of my villain, she's the scion of a family that is corrupt and evil and has done horrific things. And she sort of represents the rot of that family and the consequence of when powerful systems or organizations or families um, don't solve the evil that's happening in the everyday of them. We get this kind of, which I think is like, you know, thinking about racism or homophobia as being not only curses against people who are queer or who are of color, but also this thing that like curses the perpetrator of, of those evil systems. And, and, in, and that's what I wanted to explore in my book is like, she's representative of that rot. Um, and, uh, and I think that can be a really interesting way to think about maybe there's not a like, you killed my dog <laughs> moment where I become evil, but it's just this natural consequence of all of the things that I grew up in and was raised to believe. And they shaped me into this person with a worldview that is toxic and dangerous. And I think that is the core of so many of the people today who are doing toxic, dangerous things it's because of what they grew up in. It's because of the system they were raised in. I think there's something really interesting there that I kind of want to touch on a little bit about power and the way that I think a lot of my villains um, could be summed up with, I was born into or gained power and I'm terrified of losing it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that fear, that vulnerability that drives their actions in so many ways. Whereas when I when I think of villain origin stories, I think of, um, you know, I think of the various different characters in different medias who were are often men who had a lovely wife and some children and the wife and the children died and that made them a villain. And yeah. I think what's interesting about that model, I'm not critiquing it necessarily, I think it's a very easy way to gain sympathy for a, for a villain, is um, that that model positions villains as people who are powerless who turn to villainy in order to gain power and to rise up. And it's just a, a slightly different model. So I think if you're, I think for, for people who are listening and wondering how to build a villain, there are kind of two approaches there, right? One where somebody has power and that is what makes them villainous. And one where somebody was powerless and therefore seeks power in a way that turns them into the villain of the story. And I think those have different tones and suggest different things about the world you're building and the message you want to get across. Um, so that's something to ponder a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think it's yeah. interesting to have, um, I, I like what you said about the, the difference between, you know, do they have power or not? I think that's really important. Um, and I think it's interesting if a character, if a villain gained power with sort of ostensibly good intentions, and it's once they sort of gain that power that it becomes dangerous and that they start acting in a way that's more villainous because they once they have the power, they don't want to give it up. They don't want to lose it. And perhaps they realize that, you know, being the one in charge, being the one who has the power is more more difficult than they thought and they start making bad choices. And, you know, I, I think I think power and what you do with it is a really important part of any story involving a, a villain or a hero, really. And and also something about power that and that dynamic that you're talking about is we can think about it on the large scale and the small scale. Because so often we think about, oh, like there's the huge conglomerate or there's the evil king who rules the kingdom and has this power. But we can also think about how those pipe power dynamics play out around the dinner table. Right. And and you can think about like how how does that apply to like a single family? Right. Um, and, and how does the fear of the the child and the power of the child's parent or father or what have you do create create these power dynamics 
that can then lead to behaviors or feelings that are villainous or or something like that. So what are some of your guys' favorite heroes and villains or heroes and villains that you wish you had written and what draws you to them as heroes and villains? That's a great question. Um, I, I think one of the great heroes of recent fiction is um, Fonda Lee's Hilo in the in the Jade Shard or in the Jade City um, series because he's essentially just this like this gangster um, who wants to like fuck everybody up. <laughs> And he ends up unexpectedly becoming the head of his family. And he he's sympathetic because we love this family and we want these characters to live, but he does horrible things and um and yet ends up becoming this great leader. Um and uh and I, I think you know we've talked primarily about villains so far in the conversation, but I think that makes a real interesting character when you see someone who's not necessarily the most moral person in the world but they're thrown into this position where they have to rise or fall and what happens when they actually rise to that occasion but they bring with them all of the problematic or or, or bad guy um beliefs that uh that made you think that they were going to be someone completely different I also really love Beyonce from The Locked Tomb. I don't know if any of you guys have loved, read The Locked Tomb, but Beyonce is a great villain mm. from that series. Yeah. She's just, I wish I had written her. Mine is a, a very old example, and I always bring this book up. So, um, but Melisson Sharazai in, in Kushiel's Dart, like she mm -hmm. is so evil. I love her so much. <laughs> She's this um, very beautiful, um, sadistic, in exactly the way you're interpreting it, um, noble woman who just goes on a, a humongously complex Machiavellian scheme to take power over her, the kingdom that she lives in because she can. And that's a motivation because she can. Mm -hmm. She's really just goals for me. You know, she's an <laughs> aspirational villain for me. I, thought she was <laughs> I love that. Um, there's a book called The Price You Pay uh, by Aidan Truen, which is a pen name for Nick Harkaway. And the main character, Jack Price, is just the sort of definition of anti-hero. And it's great. The book, I recommend it to everyone. It's so good. It's such a good example of how voice can sort of carry a book. And Jack... It, 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 the book itself is this sort of arc of realizing how he starts out as a sort of normal sounding character and you eventually realize he's closer to the Joker, although a little more of an anti-hero than a pure villain. Um, and it's, it's wonderful. The one at the forefront of my mind right now um, is I just read a really great book called Shigidi by an author called Wole Talabi. And the characters, the main characters in that are not good people. They don't really have pure intentions and they're not they're not fighting for any particularly noble goal. They're kind of like supernatural thieves, um, but they find themselves cast in to this role where they, they are fighting more powerful forces than them. And they realize they're caught up in this this grand conspiracy and they become the heroes almost reluctantly. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that take on, on the traditional hero villain um, divide because these people did not want to be heroes and they, they, they very reluctantly stepped into that position. Um, and I'm also going to do what I always do in events like these and mention Discworld and Terry Pratchett um, because I think Terry Pratchett's heroes and villains are always really interesting. Uh, you know, Sam Vimes as a hero, again, as a reluctant hero who sort of starts off just wanting to to sort of get through the day and not make any arrests that day if you can possibly help it. Um, and then ending up remembering that he's quite a good person really and reluctantly doing the right thing. Um, but also the the patrician Betanari, who is occupies a really interesting position in those books. And anybody who's read this world will um will know what I mean, that he's not really a hero or a villain, and he has a very powerful position 
um, but he seems to delight in confusing everybody about what he wants and what his his motivations and goals are. Um, and he just occasionally does something very cartoonishly evil, like banning mimes in the city and 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 throwing them down a, a deep pit. Is that just evil you know. or or the opposite of that? I, I feel like <laughs> more pork, I'd be like, thank you for getting rid of all the mimes. Yeah, thank, okay. you thank you for getting rid of I'll vote for you in the next. Oh, there isn't an election. Oh, well, no. The, but yeah, I, I've I've always found that this world is full of really interesting characters who don't neatly fall into those categories of hero and villain. Neil Gaiman's dream as well from the yeah. Sandman series is a great example of that where like you love him and like he has the bearing of a hero, you know, but a lot of what he does, it's, it's very fickle and like he, you know, kills people or lets people die or traps them in dream torment for the rest of their lives, you know? Um, and, and I think Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett obviously have such a, an important relationship with each other. And I think it's a, a similar a similar vibe. The only the only one I would add to that is I love um, heroes who think they're villains, but they're so abjectly clearly not. Um, right. I read The City of Bones by Martha Wells, and um, the hero in that is you know I'm cold and I'm you know I'm basically evil and all I want is vengeance, and yet he has this humongous found family who adore him. And yeah. <laughs> to protect them going I'm doing this for cold and logical reasons and you're like mate please you're not <laughs> anybody um and I find those heroes really compelling someone in the chat mentioned villains by necessity by Eve forward which I love that's such a good book and it's so unknown it was out of print a long time but it's it's back now and um it's about a group of villains who have to that they live in a world where good has vanquished evil, but now the world is in danger of sublimating into pure goodness. And so they are, are on an epic quest to restore evil to the world to save it. It's that sounds books. excellent. I need to read that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it. an older book. And I think I have a hard copy and they stopped making them years ago, but I think they finally convinced her to put up an ebook so you can get it on Amazon now. Well, and there's a lot of fantasy, I think, that deals in this idea of like, we need the balance of good and evil, you know, and that there's like an actual, you know, need for, for these vill villainous characters, because it keeps our our world doing something necessary, um, which I don't know that I buy that as a, a principle in the real world. But in well, fiction, yeah. I can find that kind of interesting. It, that sort of gets back into like, some deeper questions of like, are good and evil referring to the like morality of particular acts, or is right. this just a sort of D and D style where they're just names for sides? Yeah, you know, there's right. there's team good and there's team evil, and the difference is only sort right. of aesthetic. Or that's you know, um, Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett in Good Omens, right? The the, mm -hmm. the difference between yes. the angels and the devils is very subtle. Yeah, I, I mean, I really enjoy. I'm sure lots of other people do as well, but the trope of good and evil are fighting each other, but they are kind of aesthetically, it's just the name for two teams. And then real big bad evil comes along and it turns out that good and evil, the two teams have to team up and fight the real evil. And I'm sure right. everybody is, is guilty of, of loving that trope as much as I do every time it comes along. Because um, it's always nice when the, the villains you've come to love end up being on the, the right side by the end of the story and everybody's friends. <laughs> but it does sort of, it, you know, it's it's very far removed from how these things tend to work in real life because you don't tend to end up teaming up with the people you hate to fight a worse evil. Unfortunately, you know, it would be nice if that was true in the real world, but I can't think of an incident of that happening. Yeah, so since there is about 20 minutes left. I would like to start on the audience questions. And I would like to start with Josh's question. How can you make a villain really evil without using the kick the dog moment or make a hero really good without an equivalent pet the dog moment? I mean, I think the problem with those two things is largely just compression that what you're trying to do is 
is not wrong. You're trying to either show why this is a person deserving of sympathy or conversely why we shouldn't like them. But kicking or petting a dog sort of trivializes and compresses that like or dislike into a very small thing. So I think the real trick is to just spread it out a little bit, you know, let us see over a longer period why this is a person we should like, you know, not just like, oh, on the way out of the house, he rescued a cat. Um, yeah. Um, and it's worth noting that those those tricks often come from movies where in a movie you have a lot less time. And so there's often this use of shorthand to kind of, you know, teach us, okay, this is this is a good character. Or this is a bad character. And uh, in a novel, you often just have a lot more room to, you know, depict what are this character's relationships with with people like? How does he treat the people around him? You know, uh, so rather than kicking the dog, maybe we see how he, you know, knows everyone in his neighborhood and he's sympathetic to their concerns and he, uh, or conversely, you know, he takes advantage of people in little ways without, you know, necessarily, you know, stealing from them. I think it it would be interesting to see more heroes in fiction who kick the dog and then realize that they shouldn't have done and face some kind of accountability for it as part of their story. Um, because real people in the like good people do bad things and fuck up in the real world. And I think that's something I try and write about in perilous times and that I want to keep writing about is the idea that like heroes shouldn't have to be kind of clean cut heroes the whole time they don't go around saving dogs or petting dogs all the time they can kick the dog and they can seriously fuck up and they can hurt the people around them but then what actually matters and and how you can tell whether they're a hero or a villain or not is what they do after that and whether they understand why it was bad and whether they face it whether they, they kind of accept accountability and responsibility or whether they're you know whether they kind of double down and say no it was right to kick the dog and i think that's a really interesting um i, I feel i'm feeling really sorry for these hypothetical dogs now that we, <laughs> we, we keep we keep extending this metaphor in more and more torturous ways but anyway um yeah i think i'd, I'd like to see more of that in in sci-fi and fantasy I think Emily Tesh's recent book didn't have, I don't think there's any dog kicking in it, to be fair. Um, I've forgotten the title completely. So if anybody does remember, please I'm Desperate but... Glory. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Had a character who severely fucked up and then found their way through to becoming a better person. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good example of that. Um, but to circle back to, to dog maiming, um, <laughs> I always think of, <laughs> I always think of Wuthering Heights um, because Heathcliff and Wuthering Heights, which I know is not SFF, um, strangles a dog. Like somebody, find, the dog doesn't die, um, but the dog is being strangled and then is saved by somebody. Um, and yet most people who've read that book would root for Heathcliff. And I think that goes to show that a lot of it is about tone and approach and how you set something up. You can make your reader um, empathize with a dog strangler if you make them compelling enough at the beginning. And whether you want to do that or not is a, is a very different matter, obviously. Um, but if you're playing in moral ambiguity, you can make quite heinous actions feel reasonable in a way that might make your reader pause and then go, oh, what do I actually feel about this character? What do I feel about this whole story um, if you set it up right? Yeah, sort of. I'm, I'm thinking of like this, the, the stepmother from Cinderella in, uh, in Disney's version of Cinderella, where she has this cat and this cat is the only thing that she actually loves. Right. And so we can have this villain who shows kindness to this animal, but we know that she's the villain because of how she treats Cinderella. We know that she's the villain because the cat is mean to the mice. And um, and the, these, these, these moments of, oh, I kicked the dog or, oh, I petted the cat, like those are moments within the arc of the character. They can't be the thing, you know? They have to be symptomatic of what we're learning in more subtle ways about who this character is. Um, so that it it makes perfect sense to us to still love Heathcliff, even though he strangled a dog, because we've seen the whole path of Heathcliff and everything that Heathcliff is, is up against. And he's not defined by that moment that can be, that moment can be 
sexy and, and get our attention, but we can't hang our characters on, well, I had my villain do this horrible thing, so now you know they're the bad guy. Um, there has to be a whole breadth and wealth of explanation um, that gets us to the point of rooting for or rooting against someone. Well, while we're on the subject of strangling and, and kicking and, and <laughs> maiming dogs, um, I don't know if anyone's read the Anno Dracula books by Kim Newman, which are, which are fantastic. But in the second one, the um, the bloody Red Baron, it, one of the main characters is the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, and he shoots a dog for no apparent reason, just because he, um, Kim Newman is trying to show us that the Red Baron is sort of emotionally dead and doesn't really care about what's going on around him. Um, but in the, the author's note at the end of the book, Kim Newman says, this is the second book I've written that had the Red Baron in it. And it's also the second book in which the Red Baron shot a dog. And if I was going to write another book with the Red Baron in it, he'd probably shoot a third dog. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, uh, well, you know, I, he had a very specific characterization for the Red Baron in mind. And he felt like, well, the best way to show this is for him to shoot a dog for no reason. And <laughs> I, if, that's, if that's the method he wants to use, then that's fine. But, you know, I, I think there might be better ways of doing it. I, I will say one t time when the this method actually works this sort of shoot the dog method because part of the other problem about whether it's kicking a dog or saving it is that the implication is that this is sort of incidental like the dog is not important to the story it's just there to show us the plot and a, a very good way sometimes of defining a villain through one specific act is someone who is tested in an important way and fails right that they are offered the chance you know take power even though it means hurting people and they do it or you know whatever the the thing is and so that that works because it's not kicking the dog it's not something that's unimportant to the plot often it's critical to the plot right that whether this whatever evil act they do is sort of what drives the story So Lindsay asks, how do you balance the different sides of an anti-hero, ensuring that they don't fall into unredeemable villain, but still maintains those heroic aspects that are needed from time to time? Just make sure they kick a dog every now and again. Yeah. <laughs> um, who do they love? You know, yeah. like... Uh, most people, even horrible people, <laughs> love someone or love something. Um, and you would think that, like, you know, if, if, if we if we think of the character of, you know, the, the classic antihero of Walter White, right? And Walter White's ultimate ambitions in Breaking Bad is he wants power. He is afraid of death and he wants to be powerful. But throughout the book, or I'm sorry, throughout the show, we're reminded that he loves his son and that he loves his daughter. He may not love his wife, but he loves his son and he loves his daughter. And he has this relationship with Jesse that's often very horrific, but there's also a kind of um, a love between them. Um, I'm not a huge fan of antiheroes, to be perfectly honest. They've been really huge in the past decade. They're not my favorite. But I do think that um, that if you think about not just the ambition or the anger or the power that drives them, but like the, the soft things that drive them, like love, um, that that can help you hold on to something about this character that will feel more humane. And I think that that you an anti-hero needs to feel human in order to work as a character. The the difference I feel like between an anti-hero and a villain is often just perspective. Mm -hmm. Um many anti-heroes if we weren't in their perspective would read as just villains because we don't get that sympathy we don't get to see what they're doing it all for um you know we don't see that they have lines that they won't cross um it's also all like from a sort of constructing a story point of view it's sort of a matter of contrast um you know i 
the I mentioned the Jack Price book earlier, and and he's definitely an antihero, and a, the a common technique that is used to make the antihero is just to make the world that they're working in even worse, right? So that you know he's kind of an awful person, and he kills people, and he does bad things, but he's operating in the world of like deadly organized crime and so you know everyone who is a target in some sense kind of deserves it because they're all gangsters or or mercenaries or assassins or whatever um you know or like john wick is another good example it was of, just like, yeah. uh -huh. a lot of people but they're they're usually in some sense trying to kill him and uh or are you know agents of some evil bad guy yeah, I feel like if you study like grim dark fantasy, if you read cyberpunk, um, if you read revenge stories, you're going to get good examples of antiheroes. Um, well, you're going to get some bad examples of antiheroes, depending on what you're reading. But um, you know, you you can also get some really good um, things to to learn from in terms of creating. Uh, and heroes who make sense in the context in which they're living. Zoe asks, what are some tips for going about writing a redemption arc? Be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, yeah. I mean, I, I say that flippantly, but it is really easy to write a redemption arc for your villain and end up justifying some really awful things. Oh yeah, <laughs> like I mean, Darth Vader. Like, what are you doing? We're, we're all yeah. we're all very happy that Anakin Skywalker remembered his inner good and killed Palpatine. But he, you know, he could have done that a bit earlier, like before yeah. Alderaan got blown up, <laughs> or before he killed all of the baby. Yeah, all yeah. the like, baby guys. Yeah. That's a good example. Like if Darth Vader hadn't conveniently died then he would definitely have been on trial for war crimes in yeah. the New Republic, yeah. regardless of whether in the end, oh, I guess he loves his son, so it's okay. Yeah. I remember um, in um, my GCSE drama class, we had a sign, I don't know why we did, but we had a sign on the wall which said, it's easy to die for something hard to live for it. Just drama things. And yeah. I think that's true. Like narratively, it's easy for a character to be redeemed by dying for a good cause, because then you don't have to deal with the war crime trial. Yeah. But yeah, if they have to live to deal with the consequences of their actions, that's a sticky thing that you have to spend a lot of time thinking about. This is actually one of the reasons why, and this will be very controversial. I don't think of Snape as a hero in the Harry Potter books oh, um, because he is often considered to have this redemptive arc because he, you know, ends up sacrificing himself at the end and he did all of it because he loved Lily Potter or whatever. The, um, but the things that Snape does throughout the series are horrific and unforgivable. And like, to me, his, his like redemption through death is kind of a cop out. Mm -hmm. um, and it allows us to just be like, oh, but look at this beautiful thing he did at the end. Clearly Snape is wonderful. And it's like, no, Snape is terrible. Um, and so you have to like, I think if you want to have a redemption arc, you have to be conscious of like, did they, how am I proving that they've earned that redemption? Um, and what consequences have they faced? What amends have they made? It can't just be, I did this good thing at the end and now I'm okay. There has to be, like, that's the definition of an arc, which means you don't hit a top and then it's over. You move through a process. You move through an arc of, of self-revelation. Um, and, uh, and that's how you get to a point where you can actually have a, a satisfying um, redemption arc because it it's earned. I'd love okay. to see more stories that continued that arc as well mm -hmm. that past the character's death and everything we've been talking about here. Like it, it's really interesting to, to bring these conversations into the text sometimes and have characters who violently disagree on this stuff. Like it would be interesting to see a scene in one of the many, many billions of Star Wars spin-off TV shows where they're doing now, where two people are arguing about whether Vader's a good guy or not, or whether, no, he's still mm. a war 
you know, and I'm sure that could be true in the Harry Potter world with two people arguing, like the fact that Harry names one of his sons after Snape. Like, I know, it's, it's so gross. <laughs> you know, did, did Ginny agree with him oh. or did they have a big argument about whether Snape was an asshole or not? And, you know, I, I, I think that's often with these big complicated questions, I find just acknowledging the question in the text and having characters disagree about it is one of the best ways mm -hmm. of dealing with it because then you're not just sort of hand waving it away and saying, oh, that's fine, they're, they're good now. They're going to heaven. They're going. That he's one of the force ghosts. Um, yeah. You know, by bringing it into the text, you get to have that that conversation on the page, which I like. I, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to get into Star Wars. I can talk with Star Wars about Alan. <laughs> but someone mentioned Zuko in the chat, who I agree has a very good redemption arc, and I think uh, it it raises the point that if you're if you're the author and you're trying to set a villain up for having a redemption arc it helps if they are closer to the a guy who happens to be on the wrong side as opposed to the the guy who is sort of puppy kicking evil and i because i think one of the problems with snape is that sort of in addition to the things he did like you know pretending to be on voldemort's side or whatever he also just abuses Harry and his friends for no explicable reason for years. Um, whereas, like, Zuko doesn't do that. You know, he works for the Fire Lord, but he's not, like, also murdering people for fun along the way, um, which makes his redemption work a little better. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And I think one of the most tricky things... Django, to touch on what you said about, you know, if you write a redemption art, it, it can be very easy to say, oh, actually, these things they did were fine. Um, is that in, you have to have a model for what redemption and forgiveness looks like in your world. Because I think that's one thing we struggle with as people. You know, what, what deserves forgiveness? How can somebody earn forgiveness? Can forgiveness be earned? What is justice? You know, can we, is it punishment or is it some kind of... Um, reconciliation of some kind these are questions we can't answer as people it's it's big you know philosophical shit basically that we have no answers to so how are you going to handle that in your world and in your book um if you have a character mm -hmm. that's done bad what does what does justice and forgiveness look like and if you can't answer that it's very difficult to write a redemption arc yeah well, and also in in most stories you don't have a convenient, all-powerful force to declare when somebody's redeemed. And so you can easily and sort of realistically should end up in a situation where some people accept this redemption and others don't, right? The, the team good guys, may some of them may be like, yeah, he's on our team now. And the other ones are like, no, I'm not doing it. I think since we started a little bit late, I think we have time for just one more question. And I apologize for those we did not get to, but Joelle asks, I often find that in many books, the villain often overshadows the hero in terms of complexity and personality. What are some tips for avoiding this and making sure the hero also shines? I think Thomas had the right idea for this, that often the problem is that you, your hero is too simple. Like if the hero is just all good and clean and the villain is this like complex, interesting character, then you get that situation. And so, I mean, you could talk about it more, but I think it's very much what you were saying. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's broadly, I'm glad you said that because I was thinking, oh, I'm going to end up repeating myself. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, as I said, I, I think we've all, fucked up once in our lives or, or probably more often than that. Um, I, don't, I think there's very few of us who can honestly say that they've never done anything wrong in their lives. Um, and I think fiction becomes better when it kind of admits that and reflects on it. Um, and, you know, is willing to depict heroes who get things wrong occasionally um, and doesn't try not, tries not to repeat their mistakes too often. Um, and I think the reader kind of connects more with heroes like that as well because they seem more human more approachable um and more kind of believable and less like these sort of slightly messianic figures like yeah. i don't know i was about to say luke skywalker even though we said we'd stop talking about star wars but luke, it, they did some interesting things with luke in the, the sequels and made him less of a sort of shiny messianic guy 
Um, and I think, you know, I, I think that's that's a broadly a good thing if you can take a character who maybe maybe a character who thinks he's he can't do wrong and he's the, the chosen one and he's the messiah, but then he does do something wrong and then he has to deal with the consequences. And it's interesting to see how he deals with the consequences. It's, a, it's also easier to be a shining messiah at 20 than at 60, yeah. um, which I think is a, is a really good thing they did in those. those movies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as an aside, somebody in the chat mentioned Deep Space Nine, so I am desperately trying not to say anything about Deep Space Nine because as <laughs> knows, I will talk about Deep Space Nine endlessly. But I think that's like pretty cool. Um, had a hand when you saw I was wearing that Quark shirt and you were like, what I, lost it. Yeah, I lost it. <laughs> Right. I think that um, we tend to, like, we do tend to gravitate towards villains. Oftentimes villains are more bombastic and so they can be like easier to get our attention. Um, and there is that seductiveness of like evil um, that can often cause us to be really drawn to um, to villains. And I think a key for, for protagonists or for heroes, as, as, as it were, is um, make them a good match for that villain, right? whether that means they are also bombastic or whether that means they are an existential and interesting threat to the villain. We always think of the villain as being a threat to the, um, to the hero. But if we can also think about how the hero threatens the villain and, and put them on that kind of footing where it actually is an antagonism, it's not just the bad guy chasing around the good guy or the good guy, you know, waving his sword at the bad guy. We can, we can get these more complicated characters who then the reader is like, oh, what's happening between them is interesting. Therefore, I'm interested in both of them. Um, and, uh, and that is something that I think about when I'm trying to make sure that my, my good guys, you know, live up to the promise of the bad guys. I also think you should make a hero hungry that, you know, a, yes. a character who is good and sweet and just sort of walks passively into a plot. Fine. Works in a lot of stories, but mm -hmm. if they desire something, if they're hungry for something, if they're mm -hmm. desperate to accomplish something or gain something, it makes them more compelling. And that's often something villains have. They're hungry. They're angry. They desire yeah. Um, and often we associate that with villainy because most of us have grown up in some kind of Western Christian paradigm, whether we are mm -hmm. Christian or not. Um, and we think that not wanting and being good and selfless makes you uh, a good person, right, broadly. Whereas if you have a protagonist who isn't like that, who wants things, maybe not always good things either, that's just much more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, 100% agree with that. Yeah, I think that is our time. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And I want to thank all of our authors for also joining us. Thank you so much. Um, and I also Thank you for having us. Yeah, this was yeah, a lot of fun. Great. Thank you. Very fun. Um, I want to remind everyone that you can buy all of these authors' books by hitting that green button and sign up for any more sessions. And yeah, thank you all so much for being here with us. Nice chatting, guys. guys. Bye, everyone. Bye.